It rises over 14,000 feet into the air. Its name is Pikes Peak. And for 71 years, man and machine have challenged the mountain to see which is best. Sometimes it's man, sometimes it's the mountain. The line between success and failure is as thin as the air, and the price you pay for crossing the line can be the most frightening moment ever experienced by a racer. Since 1988, the overall record has been 10 minutes, 47.22 seconds. Last year, Robbie Unser came close, winning his fifth division crown, but missing the magical mark, which has become the holy grail of the hill climb. Unser is back, but he is not alone. David Donner, Gary Lee Knoyer, and Paul Dallenbach all want the title King of the Mountain. The quest begins next at the Chevrolet Pikes Peak Hill Climb. ESPN, the world leader in motorsports coverage, welcomes you to Colorado Springs, Colorado for the 71st running of the Chevrolet Pikes Peak Auto Hill Climb. Hello again, everybody. I'm Marty Reed, and over my shoulder, 14,110 feet straight up, is Pikes Peak. It has been an incredible week of practice and qualifying. Records have been made in every division. In fact, the overall qualifying mark was lowered by over a second by Robbie Unser to 4 minutes 30.45 seconds. The technological advances have been astounding in this sport. For more on that, let's go to the second member of our team here at Pikes Peak, Spencer Lowe. The evolution of technology here at Pikes Peak over the last 71 years is incredible. Turbocharger systems, fuel injection, two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive, wings. They even have cars specifically built for Pikes Peak. The largest gains have been in the area of wings. Some of the teams have wings large enough to produce 1,000 pounds of downforce at 50 miles an hour. In the past, drivers have been able to change their air-fuel mixture as they go up the hill. The problem with this, they're too busy. It normally doesn't happen. The solution? a computerized fuel management system. This system analyzes atmospheric conditions 32,000 times a second and makes the adjustment. That's right, 32,000 times a second. The one factor no one can control is the weather. We're here at the 10 mile marker and it's beautiful. Let's check in with the third member of our team, Bart Kendall. He's seven miles further up the course. Well, thank you, Spencer. I'm about three miles from the summit at a place they call the bottomless pit. More on that name in a moment. Well, I think weather is going to play a major factor in the outcome of this race for a couple of reasons. First, it's extremely windy in the upper sections of the track with gusts of winds moving up to 50 miles an hour. This is really going to move the cars around as they go through the higher speed sections of the course, especially those open wheel cars with the big front and rear wings. Secondly, the extremely dry weather conditions we've had over the last several days, combined with the calcium chloride that's been laid down on the track to eliminate the dust, has made the track lightning fast. We had several track records during qualifying, and there's actually a rubber groove laid down on the track that has it behaving more like acid asphalt than on dirt. So what does this mean with the wind gusts and the higher speeds? Well, the danger level is definitely higher this year. And if you look off to my left, a mistake right here, and it's a long way down to Manatee Springs and civilization. Now you know why they call this the bottomless pit. It's 4,000 feet straight down to Manitou Springs. You're looking at Glen Cove. That's the halfway point on the race course. And those little white flakes you see, that's not snow on your TV screen. That's snow at Pikes Peak. On July 4th, the temperature at the summit, 34 degrees. It is 50 mile an hour gusts, as we pointed out. Let's give you an idea of how far this course really goes. 12.4 miles, the start at 9,390 feet, the Glen Cove halfway point at 11,440 feet. And 156 turns later, you're at the summit at 14,110 feet. Now, how do these drivers handle the stress of getting ready for each race day? Well, everybody has their own methods, some humorous, some not so humorous. Had a great day, huh? See you, buddy. See ya. Good morning, sir. 
Got your earplugs? Hey, just keep your momentum up, Reese. Yeah, I know. Hey, you know, don't slow the car down. Hit on both sides. Can't wait to get going. And neither can we, Clive. Rick Mears, Grand Marshal for the race, making his way up the mountain. Do you know there are three generations of Mears racing at this event? And Rick talked about it. I have three generations, you know, my dad, my brother, my nephew, all running in this, this race. I think that's kind of a first for, for a lot of different sporting events, not just, uh, you know, in, in automobile racing. So it's really a, it's a great opportunity and for me to be able to be back here, to be as Grand Marshal of the event, you know, to be with Chevrolet and to run the Corvette up the hill. Brings back a lot of great memories, a lot of fun. And Rick brought back a lot of great memories for all the fans as well. Bill Mears made some memories of his own. He was the first truck off the line this morning in the Dodge T300. Now this is high performance showroom stock truck. This is a V10 power plant in here. And Bill made it plain and clear. He loved racing with his family. Yeah, I tell you, it's something else just to, for all three of us to be in the same race. It's really something. A lot of fun. I've raced with my sons all the time, so that, that wasn't no big deal, but then to be able to come back and be with the grandson is really special. Well, the third generation of the Mears gang had a little oh. trouble here, Spence. <laughs> yeah, he was getting sideways. He's trying as hard as he can. It's, uh, it's loose. Well, the thought of beating Dad and Grandpa was certainly on his mind, and he was just really realizing what three generations meant. I'm looking so forward to seeing my grandfather get up this hill, and he's having such a good time. His Dodge T300 is just running great, and uh, um, I just hope everything turns out right. We get up to the top, and we have a lot of celebrating to do. Well, then it was Roger Sr.'s turn, and of course, he was uh, stuck in the middle. Did he give away all his secrets to his son? Did he get all the secrets from Dad? This was really interesting as the Mears gang was doing battle in showroom stock. Well, remember, these are totally showroom stock trucks, so they appear to be going very slow, but they're going as fast as those trucks are capable of going, and that's a steep hill. Just adding the roll cage and the rest of it was showroom stock. For Roger, a memorable moment. And uh, my dad, the guy that started this whole thing and taught me everything I know about racing uh, in front of me, and then uh, my son behind me that I passed everything on to him, almost everything. Uh, just like my dad, obviously, because he's running faster than I am, uh, didn't pass on everything either. So the tricks of the family will stay within the family, and not all of them will be shared, obviously, but as we get up towards the peak, the power drain on these vehicles, as we see the time for Bill Mears Sr. at 15 minutes, 17.4 seconds, and here is Junior still working his way and close to the edge. What a great shot that is, just looking out into space. I don't care if you're 64 years old or 22 years old, it's got to be a rush. So he makes the corner and luckily does not take us over the edge. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. <Mears laughs> Jr. Appreciate that very much. And as we work our way to the top of the mountain, Mears Sr. is not, he's going to get dusted by his dad. Oh, but he kept, he held back, he held back, <laughs> he didn't show him everything. Well, what about Mears Jr.? Could he beat Grandpa? Well, no way. He's going to beat Father Roger Sr., but he's going to cross the finish line in a time of 15 minutes, 38.5 seconds. So Bill Mears Sr. at age 64 takes home the trophy. Speaking of son Roger, he drove at the Indy 500 with Rick Mears, as did all these others, as well as driving here at Pikes Peak. That's a pretty select crowd to be in. Stay with us. When we come back, we'll get into more action at the 71st running of the Chevrolet Pikes Peak Auto Hill Climb from Colorado Springs, Colorado. Today's ESPN Speed World event is brought to you by Chevy Trucks. No company brings more race-winning technology to the street than Chevrolet. Talk about the family trees that race at Pikes Peak. Bobby Unser, a nine-time winner. In fact, he won six years in a row. He really knew how to drive up this mountain. And now his nephew, Johnny Unser, the son of Jerry, is about to take off as we get ready to race in the stock car division. And these guys can really fly, Spence. Yeah, they really can fly. And remember, what they're trying for is 12, 15, 49. They don't really care about anything else. This record's held since 1986, and that's number one on their priorities. 
And Johnny Unser takes the green flag. You see he qualified eighth at five minutes, 39.61 seconds. He is now on course for his chance to take over the lead and the championship in the stock car division. Now Johnny comes into today's race living in Sun Valley, Idaho, age 34. He's been driving 15 years. And this is one of the alternative powered vehicles this vehicle powered by natural gas, Spence. Well, you know, they're trying so many different things here at the Hill, and that really is what this is all about, getting these new technologies out here, seeing what they can do to develop these cars. Already on course, Roger Warden, he qualified fourth, and he has had seven top 10 finishes in eight attempts at running Pikes Peak. Talk about consistency, Roger Warden, one of those guys that we have to keep our eyes on. Look at the track conditions this far up. We're up in the W's. This is about 16 miles high, or 16 miles up the road, actually. And he is laying rubber down as we now move further back down the mountain to catch Lynn Cowan. He was second in this division in 1992 and looking very good in this section. Yeah, he really is. And you can see there actually is a line going on there. You can see the black down there that is the line of the course. And these guys are sticking right on it. And that, boy, that car's working really nice right there. And back on board with Johnny Unser here, and he not getting a lot of fishtail action there, so getting some good power down. They've been down on horsepower, though. Back to the top of the mountain. This is Roger Warden, just a few turns away from taking the checker flag. He's going to set the mark to beat as he crosses the finish line. Does not get the record at 12 minutes, 22 seconds, and some change back on board with Johnny Unser. He's working his way. Whoops, getting a little sideways Whoa. there. <laughs> Come on, Johnny. <laughs> Johnny, don't do these things. It gives us guys in the booth here a little heart failure because we feel like we are riding along with you at this point. He is running an IndyCar action also at this point of the, his career. He's with uh, Dale Coyne and the MyJack Racing team, and they have been doing very well, getting better and better each time out. Now here is Glenn Cove, the halfway point, the time to beat on the left, and oh, Johnny's having some problems. He's well behind. Well, you talked about earlier in the week, he's struggling with horsepower problems, and that's exactly what it is here when you can see that much difference. Well, this is Steve Overholzer. Whoa, Whoa come on, Steve. <laughs> good, good. That is bottomless pit on the other side of that wall there. You don't want to have a mistake there. Now, he qualified third, and he is soon to cross the finish line. Now, remember, the time to beat will be on the left. That will be Roger Warden's time that he has already set. And it looks like he's going to do it. Can he break the record of 12, 15, 49? Yes, a new record holder, Steve Overholzer, at 12 minutes, 10 seconds and some change and here is now Lynn Cowan and he is going through Glen Cove and is quicker than the time to beat for the split time so boy the records are going to be falling in this division as we move back to Johnny Unser working his way up through the course at the top portion now he is just about one turn away from the finish line now remember he was very slow through the halfway point the question will be can he pick something up at the top portion the time to beat will be the new record on the left He's not going to do it. He's going to have to go back and find some more horsepower. So that's going to do it for Johnny Unser, but it's not going to do it for us. Some of the crowd that camps out all night at the Chevrolet Pikes Peak Auto Hill Climb. More stock car racing action after this. At the Chevrolet Pikes Peak Auto Hill Climb, Marty Reed along with Spencer Lowe, and that is Lynn Cowan. The red dot shows you he is in the W's and working his way up the course. Now remember, the time to beat right now is 12 minutes, 10 seconds, and some change. That is a new record set by Roger Warden. Question is, can Lynn Cowan beat it? And so far, he seems to be on a good run. He was quick through Glen Cove. Now back at the starting line, Gay Smith. Hometown right here in Colorado Springs, Colorado is getting ready to take the starting line. And here comes Gay. Now this man qualified second at 5 minutes 18.92 seconds and his best stock finish back in 1988 when he finished second. And last year he ran into some trouble here, but boy he is on it now. Boy, he wants this bad. You can tell. He's trying as hard as he can, and he wants it. Oh, that, see, he's got a lid. He's pushing going in that corner a little bit, sliding around there. Mistakes like that, that's going to cost him the record. Well, it could. Uh, the question is, is Lynn Cowan going to grab the record? Now, notice how much black has been laid down on the race course. 
They have been using calcium chloride to help keep the dust down, and it has also helped make this track very, very fast. As we've seen, the records are beginning to fall like the dominoes. 12, 10, 50, he is going to do it. Lynn Cowan has broken the record for the second time today. And now, back at the starting line, Woodland Park's Leonard Bashholtz. This guy is six-time stock champion. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> he knows that record's out there. Well, he set a record <laughs> in qualifying as the number one qualifier, and he is taking that Ford Probe to the max. He really is. He's trying as hard as he can. He knows that that record's out there. Conditions couldn't be any better, and he's going for it. Look at that corner. Perfect, perfect corner. Now, remember when Gay Smith went through there, he was staggering and pushing. And here is the time to beat on the left. Boy, Gay Smith has picked it up. Can he do it? Yes. At 96 miles an hour, he's at 501.60. That's the quickest through Glen Cove so far. So he did make up for that mistake, and he's still on a record run. Oh, this is unbelievable how fast they're going up this hill. But you can see that groove is just set in the track now. Oh, and there is Leonard Bash <laughs> hooks the tire. But notice the power still pushing him up the mountain. Well, that was absolutely perfect. You can see he held the corner tight all the way through. The power was down. No bobbles. Looking great. Now, this is Gay Smith. Great view from up above. Now, as we look at this race, we should point out there is a move by uh, environmentalists and some other people, and it's being considered by Colorado Springs city government to pave the peak, and it has become a very big issue. We'll bring you up to date throughout the race on both sides of the issue. Now, here is Leonard, and whoa, whoa. this is incredible. 458.13, he has just told Gay Smith, buddy, you better have some more power at the top because I'm coming after you. Well, believe me, Gay knows he's right on his tail, too. I'll tell you that. This is Gay Smith. This is the top portion of the Ws. And look at the way the car's coming through. Very nice there. Oh, yeah, Gay is on the throttle. There's no doubt about that. He knows that if he's going to make it up this hill, no bobbles, stay on the throttle. Oh. See, he's got a little bobble there. He's, he's going to have a hard time breaking the record with that kind of uh, situation. He may break it, but the question is, will Leonard crush it? I mean, the pace that he is setting is quicker than he set in qualifying. Here he is, up above, looking down into the lower section look of the at Ws. Look how perfect he took that corner. Now, we got a record pace here. This is going to be a new one. <laughs> this is absolutely the most exciting stock car race this mountain has ever seen. And Bashholtz looking Whoop. for number seven. Now there, he got a little sideways. Yeah. Scrubbed off a tenth or two. But the question is, what will Gay Smith lay down as the mark? One turn away from the finish line. The time to beat on the left. Will he crush it? Absolutely. 12.01. 23. So a third time the record has fallen in one day, and it had stood since 1986. The gauntlet is down. Leonard Bashholtz, he must come up with the best drive of his career. If he stumbles here, he'll get a second shot at Super Truck competition a little bit later. But he looks to be on a great run. Very few bobbles. One turn to go. The time to beat will be on the left. Can we break the record for a fourth time? Oh, yes. Fashel does it. All right. 11 47 <laughs> 28. An incredible run by Leonard Fashel. Stay with us. When we come back to the Chevrolet Pikes Peak Auto Hill Climb, we'll talk to the king of the mountain in the stock car division. It was Ray Lenz who went up the mountain in that time in 1916 in a Romano Demon special. Marty Reed and Spencer Lowe at the Chevrolet Pikes Peak Auto Hill Climb. And Leonard Vashult has just covered that distance in 11 minutes, 47, and some change. And that is incredible. Well, he absolutely shattered the old record. 12, 15, unbelievable. Well, our man at the top of the hill, still a little bit cold, is Bart Kendall. Bart has caught up with the winner. I bet you Leonard's not cold. All right, Leonard Vashholtz, the victor in the stock car division, I guess for the seventh time in your career? Yep. That's right. And he has work cut out for him because four, three other guys actually got under the track record, but you had enough and you shattered it by 30 seconds. Did you think it would be that difficult? Well, I felt we'd have to set, uh, set a record to win the course today because the Pikes Peak Highway people and Tom Gaylor, the foreman, have got this road in excellent condition, but I didn't know I could shave 30 seconds off of it. But I made a few little mistakes in qualifying with... Uh, charging the corners a little too hard and I said smooth and smart's the way to get up here and my race car was handling perfect and uh, I'm just totally happy. 
Well, Robbie Unser's got to be happy. And that man in the foreground, Gary Lee Knoyer, they now know that the mountain is giving up a record-setting day. Whoa, trouble for David Donner. The word is that they had an accident coming up to the starting line area. The throttle stuck. That's got to do wonders for your confidence. And it looks like they've got some damage on what looks to be the front left section. Yeah, they have damage to the control arm. The biggest question is what damage does it do to the psyche of David Donner? Well, it takes your confidence level and lowers it quite a bit. But uh, if we can just get it to, to stick again, and if, as long as I can pull it back, I don't have a problem with it. But if I can't pull it back, that's when it becomes a little frightening. So um, especially this thing. I mean, the road is so hard today. Our acceleration is going to be rather quick. So uh, things are going to happen really at a fast rate. So we need to be able to control things. But I, th I think we'll be OK. It's just this whole week has been like that. And uh, we'll get over it confidence level. Heck, how would you like to be driving up that hill with a sticky throttle at 120 miles an hour? Oh, my word. Well, let's get ready to show you some highlights from Pikes Peak Open competition as we're waiting for the open wheel showdown to begin. They're Group A rally cars, no engine restrictions, no ground effects or wings, and the division record is 1243.74. So the first man that we are going to watch is Rod Millen. Now, he qualified first at 4 minutes 59.61 seconds. That is a new record, and this is an all-wheel drive Hyundai Elantra. Whoa. Now, remember, last year in showroom stock, he took a two-wheel front drive Hyundai to victory in showroom stock division. Whoa. Boy, he is all over the place. He's trying. Rod Millen, who also drives the stadium trucks in the Mickey Thompson series for Team Toyota, calls Newport Beach, California home. And boy, watching him drive this mountain all week has been fun. Oh, he's just absolutely incredible. Look at, look at the way that car handles. Four-wheel drive, he turns it right in the corner, steers in, hanging every single inch of the wheel off the track anywhere he can. He's using this track. Well, this brings us back as we get a look on board to the paving issue. Now, those in favor of paving say it would make the road safer for everybody, but opponents say it would turn out to be a nightmare up top when you have this thin glaze of ice that would not affect a dirt road. That's just one of several issues. Whoa, and Rod Millen working his way up course. Now, one of the things we asked him before we got into today's race action was, how will we know when you're running well from the in-car and when you're not? Well, the car's always loose, and, and basically the rear is sliding out, and, and with the four-wheel drive, we, we tend to be sort of washing across the road. Um, so the, the steering wheel is a little dead at times. So at times, I'm turning the wheel perhaps in a direction it wouldn't be normal to be turning in a normal race car, but I'm trying to keep the front pointed in, roughly in the direction I want to be going. Um, at, at, on the hairpins, I want to get the car rotated a lot around to get the, the rear right out so that the front is, is lined up to get the straight as long as possible so I can accelerate and get as much speed as possible. Uh, all, all the time you're, you're up and down, off the throttle, through the gears, don't use the clutch, just keep banging gears and, and try to get to the top of the hill as quickly as possible. Well, he has not made a mistake all weekend long as he heads towards the sump section of the course. The turn is known as sump, and it is a woolly bugger, and this is uh -oh. where he makes his first and only error and stalled the car. He was talking about wanting to get the car rotating around. I don't think he wanted to rotate it that far. And that opened the door for Akira Kamiyama, qualified second, finished second in Pikes Peak Open in the very same Nissan that he drove here last year made his way up the mountain through the snow flurries and shattered the Pikes Peak Open Division record by a minute, crossing the line in 11.42.95 seconds. Now, let's move to showroom stock action. Reese Millen, the son of Rod Millen, the third family triumvirate to be here. In 92, he won Pikes Peak Open Division. This year, drove in showroom stock, did not finish his qualifying effort, Spence, and had a very rough run coming in third. Yeah, he did. And you can see here, he's struggling. He's pushing like crazy. Almost went off right there. Went off in the previous corner. He's really fighting it hard. Here he comes at 13 minutes, 37.08 seconds. Second place in showroom stock would be Colorado Springs resident Jerry King. And he, in a beautifully painted Firebird Trans Am, made it up the mountain in showroom stock in very fine form, making very few mistakes in 13 minutes, 
31.94 seconds. But the man of the moment in showroom stock was the defending champion, John Norris. In four-wheel drive last year, he won. And this year, with both groups combined, he was a record holder in qualifying at 5 minutes, 33 seconds and some change, and came back to successfully defend his crown in the Mitsubishi. Well, Marty, you know, this finish almost didn't happen. Earlier in the week during a practice session, John went off the top of the course. The car actually was teeter-tottering over the side of the course. He was in the car for five minutes. They had a course worker sitting on the top of the hood of the car in the wind to keep him on the track. They had to air vac him out in the helicopter. He said his blood pressure was up so high he didn't know what to do. <laughs> well, it just goes to show you that fine line we talked about. Luckily for John Norris, he didn't cross it. He did set another record, though, as he lowered the showroom stock record to 12 minutes, 34.58 seconds, and Bart Kendall talked with him. Okay, I'm here with John Norris, second straight win at the peak. You're making this look easy. You shaved a half minute off last time, but you said the track changed a little bit from last night. Well, the track was a little bit looser than it was yesterday when I pre-ran. I heard on the ra uh, Mir's radio, but uh, they said it was a little slick, so I backed down just a little bit, but the track was in excellent condition. I was also wondering, Bob, we did, uh, we worked with the Starlight Foundation visit Children's Hospital. We did a hospital visit in Denver, and I'd like to say hello to all the kids who are at the Denver Children's Hospital because I thought it was great, and I really enjoyed myself. Best wishes to them. Thank you. Well, stay with us when we come back. We'll show you some highlights as we're still waiting for that open wheel showdown at the Chevrolet Pikes Peak Auto Hill Climb. Marty Reed and Spencer Lowe along with Bart Kendall back at the Chevrolet Pikes Peak Auto Hill Climb and it is a record setting day in Colorado Springs, Colorado and we're getting ready to show you highlights from super truck action. They got to be stock body, two wheel drive must equal eight pounds per cubic inch, four wheel drive equals nine pounds per cubic inch and the division record is 12, 16, 69. And it was set by Clive Smith. This was Leonard Bashold's. Remember he had won his seventh stock car title and now he was trying to make it a double for the day in Super Truck. Remember also, if you were with us last Whoa. year, this truck was a handful for Leonard, and he was unable to finish the run. Well, obviously, watching him go through this corner, he solved his push problems. But I'll tell you, he and Clive have been battling it out all week long, one back and forth, section after section. Well, this is the man to beat after qualifying, Clive Smith from Orange, California. He's in a four-wheel drive Chevrolet. Now, remember, Leonard is in two-wheel drive. He's in the Ford. So there's the record for qualifying at 513 flat. And Clive is going to give us a ride that you will not soon forget as we get very close no. to the edge. This makes me nervous. Every time I see that section right there, it just, woo -hoo. hang on, folks. We're going for a ride. Now, these two were the class of the field, and you were right. All week long, it was simply a matter of who was going to be quickest on race day because you could throw a blanket over their times. Boy, look at him. He's using every inch of the course. In fact, he drove right through that corner. You saw Vashole go through there. He was sliding around the corner. So this... What a, what a difference the two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive makes. Now, I don't know which is better, but it's a difference. Well, the guy said during the week that at 104 miles an hour, Woo. Leonard obviously has got two-wheel hooking up Whoa, very well. He's lifting a wheel. He's going. But notice, with the two-wheel drive as compared to the four, that tail end does come out. But the guys were saying they thought the new surface with the calcium chloride reducing the dust and also making it a real hard-packed course was favoring the two-wheel drive. And it would prove itself out as we worked our way up the mountain. Now, remember, 104 for Leonard. What would it be at this same point at the picnic grounds? 96 Wow, what a difference. What a difference. And here is Leonard at the split at Glen Cove. He came through in a time of 5-14. 14. Could Clive match it or beat it? Well, you can see again, he's sliding that back end around a little bit. The surface of the road with all that rubber down, he's getting hooked up. There's no doubt about that. Well, one of the things we can watch is the way Clive is handling the truck with the four-wheel drive. We talked to him before the race at what we should look for as a viewer as we're watching him drive <laughs> so close to the edge. <laughs> Uh, basically, how much work it is, I guess, when, when you're steering the car and when you're going that fast. It, it really, in, in some points of view, it doesn't look fast because of the four-wheel drive. The car doesn't get sideways a lot. So you're not constantly thrashing backs and forwards on the steering wheel, but you are working fairly hard. And uh, probably just the straightness of the vehicle in the corners, not, the very little amount of sideways slides through the corner. 
Boy, and look at how close he's coming to the edge. Now, this is Glenn Cove. Now, remember, the time to beat on the left was Leonard Vasholtz, and oh. he did it. Woo, at this these guys point, got a race. <laughs> at yeah, this yeah. point, Clive is in front of Leonard. Can he carry it through? Now, remember also, as you move up the mountain, you yep. end up losing horsepower. About 25%, some of the drivers say. Boy, Clive is just standing on the throttle all the way through that corner. See him saw the wheel a little bit through there to make it hook. Here was Leonard Vasholtz then in the W's. Whoa. Leonard, at this point in time, was actually slower as far as the split times were concerned. And, but look at the way he was pitching this board around this corner. And man, he hooked up really nicely. He was on the brakes real hard coming in the entry of the corner. Whoa, he's putting down the power, trying to keep it as smooth as possible. It was just a matter of who was going to cross the finish line the quickest. Oh, brother, this shot is just unbelievable. <laughs> that, that is a lot of sky off to the left. Yeah, 4,000 feet down. <laughs> and he has got the pedal to the floor, working his way towards the Whoa. top of the course, and that is bottomless Look at him pit. He's hooking beautifully. Now remember, the record is 12 minutes, 16.69 seconds. Is Leonard going to do it for the second time today? He did it in stock car division for his seventh, and oh, he crushes it. Gee. 11 minutes, 47.22 seconds. And now the only question was, can Clive Smith top Leonard Vasholtz and spoil the opportunity for the double? We're riding on board and you are looking out at a lot of blue sky. Make a mistake, you're going for a long ride. Take a look at this view. Oh, just beautiful. Absolutely fantastic, but no dust again on this. And that this goes course. back to what the uh, calcium chloride is doing. And also, one thing that changed also was no longer were the road graders needed day after day after day during practice sessions to level and smooth out the course. This really seems to have made an improvement. In fact, race officials are hoping this will help solve the paving issue so that they won't have to pave the road to the top. Let's get back in in-car camera for our, the rest of our e-ticket ride up the hill. <laughs> as long as that e-ticket doesn't turn left at this point of the course. Vasholtz with the time to beat at 11.47.22. Would Clive Smith do it for two years in a row in Super Truck? The answer was no. Leonard Vasholtz in the Ford would beat the Chevrolet in the battle of the factory manufacturers. And Leonard, after the race, talked about his second win. The track was really fast. You could get a hold of it, and then the cloud cover came in. It was nice and cool. Didn't have any overheating problems at all. And uh, because of that, uh, the car, I, I just had lots of power. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, then when I, there was some problem, the only problems I ran into, arised on the track was I came into some of the real tight corners, and some of the earlier competitors had, had hit them too tight and pulled gravel out on the track, so it's going to play a little havoc with the motorcycle guys. But my, my truck's got a long wheelbase, so it just skate through it pretty good. And then when, once it got hooked, I, I think the wheels were coming off the ground in front of it. <laughs> Why would Leonard be worried about the motorcycles? His son, Clint, competes in that category, and he won the Pro Open division. Chuck Lee was the man to beat in Pro 250cc action. And as we show you the other top finishers in each of the categories, we apologize. We just don't have enough time to show all the race action here at Pikes Peak. But we can tell you that all this action will be highlighted on ESPN's Moto World. So as you take a look on down through the list, Mike Coe, the winner in Pro Quad, our congratulations to all the winners here at the 71st running of the Chevrolet Pikes Peak Hill Climb. Stay with us when we come back. It's time for the unlimited and open wheel assault on the record. Marty Reed, Spencer Lowe at the Chevrolet Pikes Peak Auto Hill Climb, and that is Nobuhiro Tajima, and he is in an unlimited twin-engine Suzuki, and he does have a shot at the overall record. And we're going to keep our eye on him as he is already on course, but here are the open-wheelers. Open cockpit, single seat, no fenders, the division record, 1053.87. And that was set last year by Robbie Unser. Remember, the overall mark is 10. 47, 22, and already on course, David Hoffpower. He qualified eighth through Glen Cove in four minutes, 51.68 seconds. That smoke out the back. Yeah, he's got a little trouble right now. He's already smoking, and he's halfway up, so he's, he's got a ways to go. Well, we'll keep our eye on him, see if he has any problems. Hoffpower through the midway point. Here is Tajima. He was first in the unlimited Whoa. division last year. Remember, Whew. this is a twin-engine Suzuki, and see where he sits? Right in the middle. 
Well, he's a rally driver from Japan, and this thing's got twin engines. It's putting out 400 horsepower per engine, 800 horsepower. Back to Glen Cove. This is Stan Cosson in the open wheel division, the time to beat on the left, and he is behind the time of David Hoffpower, 4.59.15. So he has some time to catch up, or make up, if he wants to catch up to Hoffpower. Speaking of Tajima, and you talked about his rally record, well, in Australia, look at that, first in 91 and 92, and he is getting every ounce of this vehicle. Remember, last year, he won the unlimited division despite blowing a tire at Glen Cove and driving the last half on a flat left rear. Well, watch him. He's using every single inch of the road. Remember, the overall record on the left is Tajima going to do it. He's close. 10.44.22. 10.44.22. Noble Hero Tajima has laid down the gauntlet to all the open wheel cars. This is Hoffpower from Black Forest, Colorado. Can he do it? It's an 84 Wells Coyote. They've made adjustments and modifications to the wing, but he's got that smoke, and I'm not so sure that that isn't going to come back to haunt him as he works his way up the mountain. Yeah, it's only smoking out of one side, too, so he's definitely down on horsepower. The engine's giving him some trouble. Here is at the starting line David Donner. Colorado Springs, Colorado is his hometown. He is a former winner of this event, but remember, he had that stuck throttle. He qualified fifth, and he is going into the new high wing technology for the first time. You know, it take, there's a threshold that you have to go to with the different size wings, and that I'm not sure that David's got that. Plus, on top of that, he's had so much trouble, and then the trouble this morning, it's just, he, he's got to be struggling, really struggling. Back to Hoff Power as he heads down through bottomless pit. Do not turn left, David. It is a long drop. He's still got the smoke, but he's still getting up the mountain at a better rate of speed than you would have thought. Well, the car's working well. He's just down on power. So he's uh, he's utilizing every inch of the course and doing it as well as he can possibly do. Now, Hoff Power is the first of the open wheelers to cross the finish line, so he'll establish the time to beat, and he's well off the record. He's at 11.45.52. Meanwhile, back at the starting line, that is Paul Dollenbach strapping on the helmet, and the number 92 rolls towards the starting line. Robbie Unser got to be chomping at the bit to get a chance at the record. And don't count this man out. Gary Lee Knoyer doesn't do a lot of talking. He lets his right foot speak for him. The 71st Chevrolet Pikes Peak Auto Hill Climb continues right after this from Colorado Springs, Colorado. Along with Bart Kendall and Spencer Lowe, this is Marty Reed at the 71st running of the Chevrolet Pikes Peak Auto Hill Climb. And well, unfortunately, we've got bad news for the fans of David Donner. He has broken out of camera range, blown the motor in the ski area south of the halfway point at Glen Cove. So Donner's miserable day after crashing on the way up to the starting line doesn't even make it to the finish line. This is Stan Cawson, an opportunity for Stan. His best finish back in 1991. He was the 1983 Rookie of the Year here at Pikes Peak in this division, and he has finished seventh here last year. He's around the last turn, the time to beat, 11.45.52. He will take over the lead, yes, but he will not break the record. Back at the starting line, Gary Lee Knoyer has to be considered one of the favorites. He is in an 81 Wells Coyote, but don't let the age of this vehicle fool you because, as you see right there, his best finish last year, he finished second to Robbie Unser. It's also one of the four cars that has the big wing design, so you're going to count him in the picture here. This car is working well. He's driving well. He's a hard charger. Let's see what happens. Meanwhile, at the starting line, you're on board with Paul Dallenbach. He is pulling up to the starting line to get ready for his run. And Paul from Basalt, Colorado, the son of Wally Dallenbach, the brother of Wally Dallenbach Jr. He has been doing some Toyota Atlantic racing as well as Barber Saab racing. So he is now on course. And Dallenbach at 4.46.30 in his qualification effort now has to come up with the run of his life if he wants the record that Tajima has already lowered on board and look at the way this wheel gets sawed around as he is making his way up the mountain. There's a shift and a downshift. Yeah, he's doing really well there. He's just smooth as can be. Through the picnic ground section, Gary Lee Knoyer at 116 miles an hour. And whoa! whoa. <laughs> oh, gee. He comes close to the edge. Back on board now with Paul Dallenbach. And hooking the tire is important, but what about the wing? Well, that's a problem. The wing sticks out almost as far as the tire. And earlier in the week, some of the cars were crashing because they hooked the wing in the dirt bank and around they went for a spin. 
And that's exactly what happened to David Donner during qualifying. He actually cut a tire, and it uh, was the reason he was fifth on the starting grid. Here comes the split time for Gary Lee Knoyer, and yes, he is now the man to beat in open wheel, 433-34. And what's that coming out the back? Looks like he's overheating a little bit. That could be a problem. At the starting line. Look at those eyes. Ooh. Robbie Unser as he is ready to go on his assault at 10.47.22. He doesn't care about the division. He came here for one thing, and that is to take home the overall record. And he has been spectacular all week, despite the fact they had problems the first day of practice. Well, look at him. He's just unbelievable. He's using every single bit of that track he knows in order to get up the hill, he's got to keep that cornering speed up so he can accelerate out of the corners and let the wings do their job. Here we're back on board with Paul Dahlenbach. Now, don't no. count Paul out either. Boy, these guys, <laughs> they're getting more, more brave every year that we've been involved here. Stay with us. We will come back to see how this all turns out at the Chevrolet Pikes Peak Auto Hill Climb. Someday, one of these cars will be sitting in that museum, maybe as the record holder. Right now, the Paul Dahlenbach has lowered Gary Lee Knoyer's time. 4.26.37 for Paul Dahlenbach. So now the question will be, can Knoyer pick up some time in the upper sections of the course? 15 years he's been coming to Pikes Peak. His best finish, second place last year. He doesn't look as quick right there. Nice. No, uh oh, uh, big bobble, missed a shift, missed a gear. Who knows what? It just uh, he's not as quick. I don't know if he's not charging as hard or he's having trouble with the car. Well, maybe a little bit down on horsepower, but look at this shot. Can you imagine that little speck you see down there is Paul Dahlenbach? But you can hear the motor all the way up here. Little speck of the car, but look at the size of the wing. <laughs> these guys, these are specialty cars. There's no doubt. Here comes Robbie Unser. How fast is he going? Remember, he wants to be quicker in the corners. He doesn't worry. 115, though. That's quicker than he was last Whoa. year. Look at this young man fly. He has won here four times prior. Now, this is Gary Lee Knoyer. Can he make it up the mountain and take over the overall record already set by Nobuhiro Tajima? He's got one turn remaining. The time to beat will come up on the left side of the screen. And here comes Knoyer. Wait, wait a minute. Oh, Knoyer oh, oh. is over the edge. Oh, no. Knoyer, if oh. he goes another, oh, my. If he goes another 50 to 100 feet, He's it's, not moving. He's it's 1,000 feet straight down. Hold on, on here. Let's on. see if Gary Lee Knoyer. There, there, he's Woo. moving now. Woo. All right, Whew. let's catch our breath. And Spence, let's go back. Remember, the winds up here are 50 miles an hour. Okay, you see him coming in the corner. In fact, look at the left front wheel. The left front wheel actually came up off the ground. So it, it, the wind blew it sideways and blew it over the side. Oh, brother. Just one turn from the finish line, and we'll never know if Gary Lee Knoyer would have broken the record. What we're worried about right now, oh, what a great sign. Oh, thank Gary goodness. is standing up, he's out of the car, and appears to be okay. And now look at what happens. If he goes another 50 feet, as the crowd gives him a well-deserved round of applause, he just keeps rolling on down the hill. Now, here is Robbie Unser. The action continues further down Whoa. the hill. 19 seconds quicker than Paul Dahlenbach. 19 seconds. Robbie's on the throttle. He knows the record's in his grasp. He's got to go for it. We're back with Paul Dahlenbach as he works his way up the mountain. Boy, he is flying. Now, it's a love-hate relationship with the Unser. Some people really cheer for him. Others want to see people like Paul Dahlenbach, David Donner, Gary Lee Knoyer, anybody but the Unser's win. And they have won so many times. Dahlenbach has the last real chance of taking the title away from Nobuhiro Tajima. And here comes Robbie Unser in the lower section of the W's. You hear that? The engine. The engine's blown. He is slowing down. 
Robbie Unser on a record-setting pace is slowing down. And remember that love-hate relationship we talked about? You can hear some of the fans booing or cheering his demise, actually. Others will be saddened that this great racer will not succeed in his quest to break the overall mark. Now, here's the last running vehicle on the course. Paul Dallenbach, the only one left with a chance of beating Nobu Hero Tadima's mark of 10.44.22. And if he knew he was the last one with a chance, how nervous do you think he'd be? He'd be real nervous, but he knows right now he's got one job. Get to the finish line as clean as possible. Go for that record. It's going to be close. It is going to be very close. One turn to go. Watch the clock on the right. Does he do it? Yes! All right! 10.43.63. You're looking over the shoulder of the new king of the mountain, Paul Dallenbach. And we'll be back to talk with him in just a minute. Today's ESPN Speed World event is brought to you by Chevy Trucks. No company brings more race-winning technology to the street than Chevrolet. Marty Reed, Spencer Lowe, and Bart Kendall as you look at the final results in open wheel division. Now remember, Tajima wins the Unlimited. What a record-setting day. Incredible, absolutely incredible. And how disappointing for Robbie Enter. But Paul Dallenbach, excellent job, new record. We've got it back. Let's go to the top of the mountain with the winner. All right, you're looking at a very extremely happy young man here, Paul Dallenbach. Not only won the open wheel division, but beat the overall track record that stood since 1989. It was broke earlier today by uh, the Japanese driver, Chijima. Paul beat him by six tenths of a second. Did you have any idea you could beat the overall record? No, I had no idea. It's, it's incredible. It's great to have a, an American manufacturer on top, Chevrolet. I want to thank Goodyear. I mean, the tires were perfect the whole way up. I just can't believe it. I mean, I had no idea. I get up here, I was like, well, it was an okay run. Once I learn how to drive this thing, and once I figure out where the road goes, I think we'll really kick some butt. <laughs> well, you can tell who's been up there all day. The lips are frozen on Bart Kendall, but not Paul Dallenbach. Let's go back to Gary Lee Kanoyer's crash. We want to update you on Gary. See the wheel lift up? Over he goes. He is so lucky. Look at how jagged the rocks are. The car's on this lid. Oh. Well, let's hear from the man himself. That wouldn't run all the way up. Finally right there. It finally lit up and gassed it. Went out of control. Couldn't handle it. Okay One of them other, things. Okay, otherwise, yeah. buddy. You bet. Okay. I made it. <laughs> and we're glad you did. He made it back to the finish line, albeit on foot. Here is Robbie Unser as he was pulled back down to the starting line area. We caught up with him and found out what went wrong. I've heard you talk about this mountain has its own mystical ways of coming up and humbling you. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> pretty humble? Oh, yeah. I tell you, I think that. Uh, Really not, uh, to be quite honest with you. God's been so good to me up to now. I mean, Al Jr. used to tell me, son, as lucky as you are on this place, the only thing left for you to do is die there. In other words, it's all or nothing. We had a heck of a run today. The record was going to fall. As we've seen today in the 71st running of the Chevrolet Pikes Peak Auto Hill Climb, this mountain has a personality all its own. It can come up and bite you at any moment. And it is what makes this event so unique. And that's what brings us back to the issue of paving this dirt road. It's not an issue that we will decide, but for those who have to make this decision, there is a lot at stake. 100 years ago, Catherine Bates went to the top of this mountain. She was so inspired, she wrote America the Beautiful. 100 years later, would we change its character? Would we plaster over Mount Rushmore just to update it for the 21st century, getting rid of Lincoln and Washington and putting in Kennedy and Eisenhower instead? No, what is at stake? is the legacy of Pikes Peak. It is the one international trademark that Colorado Springs possesses. Change the character, you could change the race. You could change everything. For Spencer Lowe and Bart Kendall, I'm Marty Reed. Thanks for joining us on this edition of ESPN Speed World. We'll see you next time we go off-road racing. I'm talking about America, sweet America. You know, God done shed his grace on thee.